All right. Um, friends, a couple of announcements just for you to be aware of. Next week, we go to our fall schedule, which will be 9 a.m., which for Foundry people were like, what? The sun's not even up. But 9 a.m., much more me. I'm not a morning person. I have a problem with them. 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And then the following Sunday, the 20th, is when we launch um, education between services. So there won't be education next week, but we invite you to stick around and, um, and just hang out, talk, get to know each other, um, and, and stick around. But here's one of the reasons. I mean, it's a holiday weekend, and we've got about 255 people in here, and if we're going to do the work that we feel called to do, which is reaching the undechurched of our community, because in this Vriesland area, there are over 3,000 people living between like Adams and I think one street over here just to the highway, and all kind of in between this highway area, there's over 3,000 people there, and less than, I think, 1,200 have a church home. I have an idea where they could plug in, but that's just me. So if we're going to do this, one of the things we had to do is recognize we've got to go to two services, and that falls back to you. Don't hesitate to invite any and everybody. Today, um, our, t- our message title is Unlikely, and one of the reasons um, I went with that is because one of, a lot of times we look and we think, well, maybe this person could fit in church, but you know, I don't know if they would. Let's just throw all that away. Any and everyone you meet is supposed to encounter Jesus Christ through your life and be invited into God's family. It's on you. It's on me. We have to be about that work. So next week, 9 and 11 is our Sunday morning service times. Also, after today, we have the farmer's market up for one more week. I will talk a little bit more about that uh, through the end of the service. But um, tons of service opportunities. We need two two things really key right now. Um, Greeters. Because if we're getting a ton of new people, we need to be able to greet them and really welcome them into the family of God. Because I don't know about you, but there is some anxiety when you come into a new church and you don't know anybody. We want to make sure we're really welcoming them well. And the hospitality table, the blue table over there, if you want to be a greeter and you can smile and shake someone's hand, you're qualified, just go sign your name up, we'll contact you, and we'll get you invested and involved. The second thing is this, nursery. We've got a lot of little babies in this, uh, in this community. We need some nursery help. We love having high schoolers, but we need some adults to sign up. So if you like babies, sign up. If you don't like babies, there's something wrong with you, not them, okay? Because they're babies. How do you not like a baby? All right, enough said. I'm going to pray. Come, Lord Jesus, and speak and tell the most unlikely of tales. The story where a God did not see fit to be separated from those who bore his image, so he sent his son to redeem them. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for the gospel which we preach, the gospel which binds us to you, and the gospel which we seek to live. May it be so, by the power of your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, as I said, the story today is unlikely. There is a reality that goes on within the church that we, um, we're going to wrestle with today. And we're going to read through a pretty good chunk of scripture, about 18 verses. And it comes out of Acts chapter 9. And it's a great story. And I want to tell you a little bit about it. There was in um, Acts chapter 7, there was a young man named Stephen. And he loved the Lord. And he got in trouble for converting people and giving a testimony of Jesus. So he was brought before the Sanhedrin. And he gave a faithful witness of his faith. And he was stoned to death. Which is not how it means nowadays. He was thrown rocks at until he died. It was a brutal death. And one of the men standing there holding the coats of those who killed Stephen was Saul. Saul would later become the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. There's our scene. Let's read together. All right. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any in Damascus who belonged to the way or the gospel, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Go to that next slide, Josh. Thank you. 
The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into, into Damascus. For th three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, answered Ananias, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house, entered it, placed his hands on Saul, and he said, I love this line, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he has sent me here so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, and he was baptized. That is an unlikely story of the author of two-thirds of the New Testament. Why didn't God call Ananias? Why didn't God call somebody who was praying and faithful and loved him? Why did he call someone as horrific as Saul? I think the question is a little misplaced. Why don't we believe he's calling us? Why do we only believe in a likely God? A God who only works within logic and reason. Why do we want to so capsulize God so that we don't have to feel the tension and the pull that says we're not there yet. We are constantly transformed and being transforming and being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. God does not tell likely stories. He is an unlikely God to an unlikely people who wrote with his own blood the most amazing story of grace and salvation to all who would listen, hear, and receive. The story of Saul gives me hope, personally. And I want to unpack the text a little. If you'll go to that next slide. Um, now, you may wonder, I put this slide up last week, bookends, okay, that's bookends, that's a lightsaber going through a blast door, because I'm a dork, and I'm good with that, it was Force Friday last week, anybody know that? Again, alone in a room, it's, it's happened many times. You don't have to feel bad for me, I, my shame is overwhelming at times. All right, so these are bookends, go back real quick, Josh, don't pull that up for me. These, these bookends, what you do is you take a bunch of information, and you squeeze it together, and you hold stack of book ups, right? Books up. You, you kind of pull them together like this. This story has a unique set of bookends to it. And I love the idea that God, working through um, kind of opposites. I want you to go ahead and pull that up now, Josh. I want you to look at this with me and see, front to back, this text is screaming transformation. There is nothing that remains of the old Saul. Even his name becomes different in this story. He is completely transformed. One, verse one, meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Question for you. Has anybody here ever been threatened? If you're a younger sibling, the answer is yes. You tell mom and I swear. You know? No? Again, only me? All right. Like, anybody, seriously, nobody has ever been threatened? How happy is Zealand? Okay. Goodness. I'm like, is San Diego that bad? Um, okay, so like when you're threatened, like there's a few different postures you can take. You can turn and kind of square up on them. You can be like, run and turn and flee, but you have to address the threat. But has anybody here ever had a murderous threat thrown at them? Like, think about that, a murderous threat. <laughs> you had Terhar's down there, yes, yes, I have. Seth is <laughs> nodding. I'm like, really? What did you do? Um, like a murderous threat. I remember when I was young, I got my brother in a lot of trouble. 
And, um, and I walked by his room, and he had, was sent to bed super early. It was great, and the house was peaceful. And um, he's in there, and he was like 10 or 11. And I walked by his room, and it sounded like Yosemite Sam, if you know who he is. I just heard from the darkness, I hate you. It's like, who just says that? You know, like, it, it, there was, it, I believed him. And I was like, you know, I stepped away from the dark door. It was unnerving. Like a murderous threat. So think of that. Saul, Saul is breathing them. Every breath he takes is a living, breathing, murderous threat against God's disciples. Not a friend. Okay? The, verse 18b. The moment he could see again, Understand that he's standing now in the presence of those he went to arrest. Ananias is there. He's probably there with a few other people from the church. He had his prey in his hand. And immediately when Paul could see again, he got up and he was baptized. Which tells me this. When the Spirit of God invades our life, there is a transformation that alters our desires. There's a desire. Now, I'm not saying we don't struggle with the old desires. I'm saying there's an initial reaction that alters our desires. And I want to ask you a question. When's the last time that you weren't governed by what you desire constantly? When's the last time? Because when I look at Saul's story, there's a moment where he's breathing murderous threats. Then he takes a donkey ride up over these mountains into Syria. He's going to Damascus and he gets knocked down and everything changes with one brief conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it didn't sound like, I'm sorry, I repent, I believe. It was Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul replying, who are you? But upon hearing the name, I am Jesus Christ whom you persecute, everything changes. Everything changes at his name. When's the last time you started being transformed by the breathing of God's name, by living out Jesus Christ in everything you do and everything you are? Because I'll tell you this, when Paul got his sight back, Scripture tells us he had not eaten or drinking anything for three days. Has anybody here ever been to a desert? A few of us? Yeah. Like you go out west to the deserts and it's so hot and dry like, I've been on the border of Syria. I was in Lebanon looking down on the plane that goes to Damascus. Hot, flat, dry. Three days he hadn't eaten or drinking. Most likely not drinking is the bigger issue at this point. He is parched. And he goes to water to get a drink or to be baptized. His thirst was minor in compared to his desire to be brought into the death of Christ and raised up into the life of Christ. When we talk baptism, that's what it is. You are baptized into the death of Christ so that when you're raised up, you are raised up into the life of Christ. Paul hadn't drank anything. He was in the Middle East, steaming hot, rode a donkey. It wasn't air conditioned. He got there. He had nothing to drink. And when he gets to water, he sought only to be dipped into it and pulled out to become part of the family. For you and I, we have to recognize that encountering Christ overrides all our base impulses for a season. And then we begin the struggle of working out our salvation with fear and trembling. So, second thing we want to do in unpacking the text is this, is to understand that next point, if you would, Josh, um, is when we look at this, we have to realize that for Christianity, there's this false belief that you a life of perfection is required for being called into Christian service. Uh, not true. Completely false. There is not perfect Christians. We have a perfect Savior. I have been a pastor for quite a while now. I have hurt people. I have made mistakes. I have been unkind, uncaring, ungenerous of spirit. I have, I have failed. I am not a perfect Christian by any stretch of any imagination. But I will tell you this. I serve a Savior who is molding me into his image. And so for you the same. You don't have to be perfect. It's a lie. I'm standing before you as testimony to the imperfection of Christians. But I'm also standing before you as the, the voice calling that you can't stay there and be like, well, that means I can't serve. That's garbage. You are called into 
and through his power into a new life, transformation comes from encountering Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something. When, when Paul was, when he became a Christian, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And he was baptized and he went out and planted churches in the power of God. When they saw Paul, they no longer saw Saul from Tarsus. They saw an image of Jesus Christ. For you and I, that's an image we want to hold on to. Are you and I looking more and more like Jesus Christ? Is our story becoming more and more unlikely because of his unlikely grace to us? We have to wrestle with the fact that quite often we're like, well, I'm a little too messed up to serve. And some people have issues where maybe you shouldn't serve in certain areas, but we're all called into the ministry. We're all called to be living disciples and witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing I want to point out in this is this. Pull it up, Josh, if you would. The community of God participates in the transformation of others. This is huge for you and I. We often think that people come to God and they like run down like, oh, I want to be saved. You know, that's great. But the community of God is always called alongside. Do you know in the story, it's not just that God knocks Saul off the mule and, you know, like takes him to Tarsus or takes him to Damascus and has him wait there for three days. What does God do? Could God not have finished the job? Could he have not been the finished carpenter on that and kind of put it up, made it look nice? No. He calls a man named Ananias and he sent him to the house of someone named Judas. Do you see what's going on here? You may not know the story, but Ananias and Sapphira, now this is a different Ananias, but the names Ananias and Sapphira are, are linked with lying to the apostle Peter, and God strikes them dead right there. Ananias, not the best name in the Bible. Then there's Judas. Who wants to be the poor first century sap named Judas? Judas, not that one. You know, like how do you introduce yourself? How do, you, how do you communicate that? Note that God is making a connection here that the community of God, imperfect, because those two names draw your mind kind of to an imperfection, but they don't draw your mind away from the reality that God is a God who is gracious, calling his community alongside them. He calls himself, his community, alongside the broken people. So we have Ananias, who again, I want to make sure you know, Ananias and Sapphira, they are... Not, It's different people, but the same name, okay? So when we look at this, we recognize that there is something going on. The author, Luke, is trying to help us understand the reality that God's community doesn't matter what your name kind of smacks of. When people say your name, they go, oh, that guy. It doesn't matter. In this community, God calls the very person that Saul came to persecute to go and welcome him into the family. And it's one of the reasons, it's one of my favorite scriptures in this passage. When he leans down and his very first words to the apostle Paul, but still then Saul, he says to him, brother Saul. The very first thing he does is open up all access to the family. There's no hinges, no caveats, just come on in, brother Saul. God's family participates in the transformation of other lives. And it's why I said to you today, you've got to be inviting people. You've got to be investing in what's going on over here because this can't be a Sunday morning tradition. This has to become part of who we are. We become transformed to be out in the world transforming other people. So we're going to work for a minute to apply this in three ways. And as we apply it, I think one of the things I want you to understand is that for us, this is where it gets a little dicey. This is where it gets a little scary because when we begin taking this home, it alters the way we're perceived and the way we feel like people receive us in life. First thing is this. Invite the disaster of transformation into your life. Pull that bottom part up too, Josh, if you would. Um, I, I can't be any more blunt than this. Transformation is painful. It feels more like demolition. The old you must die so that the new God infused you can live. And I will tell you this, we have to be honest when we ask this question. Do you want the pain of transformation? Do you want the agony of losing you and becoming him? It is not an easy road, but I will tell you this, there is no peace like that. 
that knowing you have died to yourself to fully live to him. Who here needs God, and I love this word, to smite? It's a great Old Testament word. Who needs God to smite them off of their comfortable religious life? Anybody in here feel that way? Like, I've been kind of doing the church thing, and I don't really know if I, you know, what I'm supposed to do. I want to tell you something. God is in the business of kind of, you know, taking a one wood or a driver and smacking our religious life out into the middle of the world and putting back together someone who is formed like him. We have comfortable religious lives. And I think the reality is God wants to undo those and make us radically uncomfortable in who he's called us to be for the glory of his kingdom. If it were a likely story, he wouldn't care. But this is unlikely. He is transforming us. He is calling us and then transforming us. Transformation comes to us from a holy God, and that holy God is always calling us to himself. Are you tired of holding up the world like Atlas? You know, that, that, that statue in New York, and it shows him he's just jacked out of his mind. He's huge, and he's rippled, and he's holding the world on his back. Do you feel like Atlas sometimes? Every muscle straining, how am I going to keep this up? And I think God oftentimes is saying, just let it fall. Quit being what you're not. And come to me, you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Rest that transforms you like it did Saul. He transforms us. And oftentimes he uses his community for it. The second point of application, go ahead, Josh, and bring that up. The second point of application is great. We need to understand that this is not a spiritual supermarket. You are wild caught. God and his community welcome you even though you are messy. You walk into a grocery store. You walk up to Myers and you're like, I want salmon. And there before you, pink and lovely, is salmon. Anybody here ever catch a wild salmon? Yeah. Did it look like that? No, it comes out. I mean, how would it bite the hook? It has no face or head in the store. It's all clean and laid out. Look how pink I am, you know? But a wild-caught salmon's got a weird little hooked lower lip and kind of crazy looking. And when you unzip them, you're like, you know? Seriously, it's messy, isn't it? If you want to get to the good stuff, unless you're Bear grills and you just pick them up and eat them like a wild animal, which is awesome, but still, we don't, I don't encourage that. You've got to clean them, right? We need to understand each one of us is not a farm-raised Christian. We're not like in the grocery store where everything's perfect. Look at my perfectly presented life. Ah, don't want it. We're wild-caught. We come in and God's cleaning us. There's part of us being removed, our sin and our broken past, and he's calling us into a different future. And we recognize that God and his community will welcome you and your friends and everyone you invite, even though you are messy. The other day, I was, uh, we went to Chicago on Friday? Yeah, Friday. We went over there and we drove over and went to the Lincoln Park Zoo. We were walking down Michigan Avenue. And as we were walking down Michigan Avenue, there's a guy sitting with a sign. And my kids are, like, they, they love to give to homeless people, and it's very expensive. And, um, well, it is. I mean, it, it's, it's okay. I mean, I, that came out all wrong. Um, <laughs> but there's a guy sitting there with a sign, and it laid out a tale of want and woe that would cause your lip to quiver. It was so sad. And he's sitting there on his milk crate with, a, like, a Burger King cup, and it had some money in it. And um, my son Ethan took over and put a dollar in his cup. It was nice of him. It was my dollar. And um, the guy's sitting there, and I looked over, and I noticed the guy's crying. Me, being very soft of heart, was like, that's weird. That's good. And my daughter looks at me, and her little chin's all puckered up, and she goes, do we need to ask him if he knows Jesus? And I'm like, oh, what are you doing to my day here? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the Disney store. It's Force Friday. They own, it's going to be great. You're killing me, Whitey. Come on. And so we walk off. And every step I took, I felt like Atlas. The burden was getting bigger. And I finally looked at Bella and I said, look, after we go to the Disney store, priorities first. Um, <laughs> after we go to the Disney store, we'll come back. And I began praying, please leave that corner. Please go away. I don't want to do this. What are the people on Michigan Avenue going to do? I mean, he's right in front of the Ralph Lauren store. I don't want them to judge me. Like, I, that's what I'm thinking. Who are these clowns in the Ralph Lauren store? I don't care. So we go back over. Bella takes out some of her own money, puts it in his cup. 
And I'm sitting there and I'm like, and I walk up and I just start talking to him. I had to kind of prepare myself because, you know, I'm a pastor and this is difficult. I know it's sad, really. And um, I walk up and I start talking to him and I realize I'm like looking down on him. So I just kind of squat down on my haunches, if I have haunches. And um, I squat down and I said, how you doing? Not good. So I just look at his sign and it says, my mom died of breast cancer in March. I said, um, when did your mom die? You know, even though the sign says in March. And I said, uh, how are you doing? He started getting a little quiver. He said, not good. But the whole time, everything's here. We're just talking, and I'm trying, and I just kind of slapped him on the calf, like, I want your attention, I'm trying to talk to you. And I said, I kind of hit him on the calf, and he, his eyes came up a little, and I said, um, I'm sorry. That's all I had to say, I was sorry, I felt bad for the dude. And he looked me right in the eyes, and it's the first time I saw his teeth or anything, and he said, thank you. And I said, what did you do before you ended up here? I'm a carpenter. Oh, Really? Yeah. I said, what's your name? He said, Eric. And I'm like, aren't we awesome? He just looked at me. I said, that's my name too. And this whole time, his eyes brighten up, his smile broadens, and he's looking at me. He goes, C or a K? And I'm like, please. Does anybody spell it the wrong way? You know, and he looks at me. He's like, C. I'm like, oh, because I'm an E-R-I-C, not a K. And I was hoping he wasn't a K. I rolled the dice. I had a 50-50 chance. And he's like, I know, right? Who spells it with a K? And if you do in here, I'm sorry, we judged you. And, um, <laughs> So we started talking, and we're talking about what he's doing, and he was coming back to help his mom, and then after his mom died, he's like, I just didn't care. I just didn't care. And I said, was she a Christian? And he kind of went, <sighs> and I could see that he was wrestling. He looked at me, and he's like, yes, but you could tell there was no comfort in it. And instantly, a scripture that has held us up as a family in times of darkness, Psalm 115, verse 16 precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. So I said, can I share a scripture with you? And he looked at me, he goes, yeah. So I told him that scripture and I said, it tells me this, that yes, your mom died, but more than dying, God called her home. She's not gone. She's transformed. She's with him. It's okay to grieve and let go. And I'm just sitting here going, I didn't care who was on Michigan Avenue at this point. It was Eric and I. I mean, I introduced Bella, but I was hoping she was still there. I had kind of dialed in. I had this moment where I'm sitting there going, and all I wanted to do was get away from him in the beginning. Oh, you make me uncomfortable. And I didn't know that God was going to slap me across the head with this young man's life and say, look up. The world is waiting for the church to look up. I am the chief among sinners when it comes to ignoring the hurting and broken around us. But I will tell you this, that Eric needs a church. And he's in Chicago. And I feel a tremendous amount of guilt that I can't do anything about it. But I will tell you this, there's people here just as broken as him who need someone to look them in the eyes and say, I'm sorry, or you're welcome here. There's people who have to start telling and living an unlikely story in an unlikely culture for the most unlikely results that people will be transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. The final thing is this. Welcome every new brother or sister, no matter who you are or who they are. Um, you get a new name, a new identity based on what he did, not who you are. So if you're here and you've had like multiple affairs and you're a really bad person in your own eyes and you hate yourself or you're a drug addict or you're a closet alcoholic or you have abuse issues in your home or anything going on, you are not here because of your brokenness or goodness. You are here because of his goodness. We serve a God and King who transforms us into his image, not him into ours. So everyone who comes in here, is welcome. Everyone who comes in here gets treated as a son and daughter of God, a brother and sister of you and I. And hopefully it's about to get messy in Christ's church. Because when the world comes roaring in, wondering what's the answer, the answer is we tell them the story of our broken life. We don't get to play perfect. We get to welcome them just as they are, messy and broken. But we got to welcome them not because we're good, but because honestly, we are blessed to call ourselves Christians. Your identity, your life is not your own. And I have to ask you, will you take that story of me with that guy who I didn't want to engage and own it yourself? 
and feel the same shame and regret I feel over all those people we've ignored all around us and get to work with an unlikely gospel living through the unlikely life you're living. Because I'll tell you this, what if Saul hadn't believed God could change him? We'd be missing two-thirds of the gospel, or two-thirds of the New Testament. All the stories of the early churches, gone. Now, I believe God might have raised someone else up, but he raised up someone who was started breathing murderous threats, and by the end, he didn't even want a drink of water. He just wanted his head under it. He wanted to be baptized into the faith. I will tell you this, there's a world thirsty to be dipped into the death of Christ and raised up into new life. It is your opportunity to live into it. My friends, this is the gospel. How now shall you live? Pray with me. God, we recognize that by no power of our own living can we, um, can we do this. So we ask, Holy Spirit, you are the most mysterious member of the Trinity, God. We, we don't understand you, Holy Spirit, all the time, but we ask, would you come and would you fill us like you did Saul so that our murderous threats against the world would cease and your love for them would just bubble right through us? Even so, come Lord Jesus, break us, change us, transform us in the most unlikely and wonderful of ways. Pray it all in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Stand up, sing with me.
there's a reality in Christianity, and, and we don't often talk about it, but I'll use myself as a quick example. You know, a few years ago, I was probably the most cocky, self-assured, wound-up individual I know. I just thought I had the tiger by the tail. And God came crashing into my life and just kind of wrecked me. Wrecked me. It was devastating. And I wouldn't go back. I don't care if you slid a check for a billion dollars in front of me. I wouldn't go back to that guy. But it hurt to be transformed. But I invite you to it. Because the unlikely story of Saul tells us this. That it won't be easy. But by our witness, the world will know that Jesus Christ is exactly who he claimed to be. So if you're wondering, how does the transformation begin? I don't know him. You come see me. I'd love to talk with you about it. If you're wondering, how do I plug in? Don't leave. Get a cup of coffee, get a cookie, and come hang out at the farmer's market. Get plugged in. Find your place, raise your voice, and live for Jesus right here. Because for you and I, it comes down to this moment. What will we do now? Not tomorrow, not yesterday, now. I encourage you right now, stick around. Stick around. Drink some coffee. Get to know some people. See where you belong in this faith, in this family. And then dive in with all your heart. Because transformation, though costly, is the best thing that could ever happen. As you go from this place, may you go in the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of God your Heavenly Father, and bound in the unity of the Holy Spirit, which unites us into one family, one faith, one confession, and one creed, and that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. My friends, you are not dismissed to leave. Worship is over. Community has begun. Stick around, drink coffee, eat cookies, and stay together.